Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. In today's program, we're going to be talking about what Mr. Biden has done and not done for student debtors. We're going to talk a little bit about the meaning of Bastille Day in France, just over. It's their 4th of July equivalent that happens on the 14th. And finally, we're going to talk in the first half about the so-called invasion of artificial intelligence and the so-called threat to our jobs that it represents. There's a blizzard of commentary about that these days. And in the second half, I think you will find fascinating an interview with Dr. Harriet Fraud about the crisis of the family in the United States, where it comes from and what it means. So let's dive in. But I'll begin by reminding you that we have a volunteer, Charlie, who is interested in helping me to connect with those of you that have suggestions about topics you think we ought to cover. If you have materials to send, articles, and so on, please send them to charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Charlie will be in touch with you and will be the in-between getting your materials to us so that we can work on those that fit our program. Okay, let's begin with President Joe Biden, who suffered some weeks ago the decision by the Supreme Court in this country to uh, block the plan he had developed for a modest partial relief of student debt. We have over 40 million, maybe closer now to 45 million Americans carrying student debt. They've been able to postpone repayment because of the crisis of 2020 and the pandemic. But the plan to give them some real relief uh, was shot down, as I say, by the Supreme Court. And so Mr. Biden, with enormous fanfare of the sort our politicians seem to really like, made a big announcement very recently. And here's what it said. 804,000 students will get relief, and it will be worth $39 billion. Sounds big, right? $804,039 billion. Well, I did the arithmetic, just so you understand what Mr. Biden did and didn't do. 804000 that works out to 1.8% of the student debtors in the United States. The other 98.2% get nothing from Mr. Biden uh, in response to the Supreme Court. And the $39 billion, that's 2.2% of what those students owe. Starting now in a few weeks, those students, the vast majority of the 45 million, will start having to pay back between three and $400 a month, money which many of them do not have money which will eat into what they can do with rent or with food or with, you see the picture. It's an extraordinary thing uh, to do. But I want to stress again, the hype of the media presenting this as some kind of important act, it's a horrible, bad joke on the problem of debt in this society. Not just student debt, but the debts everybody else has mortgage debt for your home, car payment debt for your automobile, and your credit card debt. These are all enormous overhangs of debt that have been taken on by people who don't earn enough money in their paycheck so that they wouldn't have to borrow. I want to turn next to Bastille Day, July 14th every year, when the French nation celebrates its revolution. And to do that, it might be useful for me very briefly to go over what that revolution was all about. Back in 1789, right after the American Revolution, the French rose up. They had been suffering for a good century before that. And you know what they suffered? Something that ought to give us pause. 
they suffered the decline of the standard of living of the French people. Bad harvests, price increases, serious breakdown of their feudal economic system. And at the same time that the mass of the French people were suffering, they were able to watch the super rich, the one half of 1% at the top, you know, Louis the 14th, Louis the 50th, they, they liked that numbers in the game. And those who had money could go to the home of the Louis on the outskirts of Paris, called the Chateau at Versailles, where they could see spectacular acres of carefully maintained gardens and walkways. Yeah, the super rich, you know, the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezoses of that time. And at the end of a century, it exploded in a violent revolution that ended feudalism in France and brought in capitalism. That's right. The transition from pre-capitalism to capitalism was bloody and violent, as these kinds of things are, in large part because you squeeze the mass of people beyond what they could endure while showing them that the vast wealth of the country was humoring a tiny group of people who had nothing better to do than to build the Chateau of Versailles. Okay, parallels with our country should be obvious. Now I want to turn to artificial intelligence the latest technological breakthrough. You know, we've had atomic energy, electricity, chemistry, the computer. We've had a lot of big technical breakthroughs over the last few hundred years. So this is the latest one, artificial intelligence. And as before, the first step in introducing it to the population was to marvel at what it could do. The second step was to recognize that what a technological revolution means depends on how a society uses it. In a capitalist society, we allow the decision about how to use a technology to be made by a very small group of people, the employer class, two to three percent of the people at most who are employers, you know, boards of directors of corporations, owners, operators of medium and small businesses. They decide whether to use a new technology, how to use it, how to install it, all of that. And that's really what matters, and I'm going to show it to you with artificial intelligence. What employers do is maximize profits. They look at every technological change, whether it's artificial intelligence, computers, robots, or anything else. Can it help my profit? How will that work? Is it profitable? And if it is, I'm going to use it and I'm going to install it to make the most profit. So let's imagine together, you and I, that there's an artificial intelligence operation that doubles the productivity of our workers. In other words, Workers using artificial intelligence can produce twice as many outputs of whatever good or service they make as they used to before artificial intelligence. What does the employer do? Well, he rubs his hands together. He's excited. He can bring in the artificial intelligence and fire half his workers. Let's go through the arithmetic. With half the workers and artificial intelligence, he produces just as much as he did before. He can sell it just as he did before, charge the same price as he did before, and earn the same profit as he did before. Oh, wait a minute. No, he's going to make more profit. Why? Because half the workers are fired, and the money he used to give to them for wages he can keep for his own profit. So he gets the profit he made before plus what he doesn't pay to half the workers he fired. Is that what employers will do with artificial intelligence? You bet. Does that make it real to worry about all those unemployed people and what will happen not just to them, but to their families, to their innocent wives and children and husbands? to the community that depends on these people to spend money and be there. And yeah, it'll be terrible. 
But now let's be real clear. Nothing about that is inevitable and nothing about that is necessary. Let's take a look and see. You could take that piece of artificial intelligence, that latest technology, and you could use it as follows. You could say to your workers, I have really good news for you. Your workday is going to go from eight hours a day, five days a week, to four hours a day, five days a week. I'm going to cut your labor time in half. Why? Because working half the time with artificial intelligence, now that you're twice as productive, will give me just as much output as you used to give me in half the time. I will sell it and I'll make my usual profit. And the artificial intelligence will have been used to give you, the workers, an immense improvement in your life by giving you a half-time job at the same pay you got before and therefore paid leisure four out of every eight hours during the week. Wow. Artificial intelligence could allow that? Yes. And you know, that would be the more democratic way to use artificial intelligence because helping the mass of employees is a much more bigger social benefit than helping the owner, operator of the business, a tiny minority who already get a profit, enabling them to get even more profit by firing half the workers. The workers know which is better. You and I know which is better, don't we? Artificial intelligence handled in that way wouldn't fire anybody, wouldn't deprive anybody of the income they were already earning, wouldn't hurt their families, wouldn't hurt their community, and the employer would still get the profit they got before, but would have become an employer who transforms the lives of those people who now have four free hours a day they never had before to do poetry, to paint pictures, to go for walks with their children, to renew their relationship with their spouse, and all the other important parts of life. Could artificial intelligence do that? Yes. If businesses were not organized as profit-maximizing capitalism, but as a worker co-op, that's what they would do. Workers together in a co-op would use artificial intelligence because it gives them all leisure. It pays them for half a day the same amount it paid them before. It generates a surplus or profit, if you like, just like it did before. The real gain is the leisure of the many rather than the profit addition of the few. That's why it's important to understand how capitalism works. That's why it's important to understand the peculiar way capitalism installs new technology. It always does it according to the rule of, ma of maximizing profit. We let employers determine how artificial intelligence is used. Yeah, it will maximize profit and it will lead to millions without work. Wow. But that's not necessary. And if you don't want that to happen, you got to be critical of capitalism too so it doesn't pull a fast one and present as necessary something that's conveniently profitable for them. Thank you very much for your attention. Please, we've come to the end of the first half. Stay with us. The interview with Dr. Fraud will be fascinating. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very pleased to bring back to our cameras and our microphones Dr. Harriet Fraud. She is a mental health counselor and psychotherapist here in New York City. She hosts the podcast Capitalism Hits Home that you can find on our website, democracyatwork.info. She's also the co host uh, of the podcast, It's Not Just in Your Head. Her radio show on 
weekly on WBAI in New York City is called Interpersonal Update. It airs Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. Her latest written works appear in the book Class Struggle on the Home Front. So first of all, Dr. Fraud, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. I wanted to begin by talking about something which is important in any real study of economics, namely the family. How you evaluate an economic system depends in large part on how it treats or doesn't the family as an institution. It is just as important as how well an economy provides food, clothing, and shelter to all of us. And at the same time, the family is crucial because it's in the family that the children are raised, that the workers recoup their energy day to day. Therefore, what happens in the family impacts the economy. It's not very well admitted or understood or acknowledged. And that's one reason it's important to bring it to the forefront now. So let me begin by asking you whether you believe that the American family is in some sort of crisis now. And if you do, what is that crisis and what can you tell us about it uh, as we get into this conversation? Well, the American family is in a desperate situation, partly because America relies on family totally or almost totally for social reproduction of people, teaching people how to behave, teaching people how to relate, being the emotional center of people's lives. And family does not exist in a way that could do those jobs. The majority of children, since they don't have daycare, are neglected in their early childhood. One out of 10 parents admit striking their children with objects. Child abuse goes down at age six because children get out of their family home and have to be in school because it's mandated. Now, that parents are left entirely abandoned with their children. It's not like France where they have a dollar an hour daycare starting right after birth, no. Daycare is very expensive, modest costs for sort of regular daycare, nothing advanced, or as much as community college tuition, 10 to $12,000 a year per child. And so young children spend their most vulnerable years and also the, the crucial years for brain formation, zero to two, and then two to six, in cramped inferior daycare, parked in front of televisions in their wet diapers, or shuffled from pillar to post while their parents, their their mothers, because it's overwhelmingly mothers, are working. And single parenthood has gone up, single motherhood has doubled in the past time in the United States. And women have to cope alone and also have to work for a living after uh, Bill Clinton suspended welfare protection for mothers of dependent children. And so children are in terrible trouble. Also, because women are paid so much less than men, one in four children in New York City is hungry, just as one in in eight adults across the United States goes hungry. And food is necessary for development too. Healthy food, children are left alone in their apartments, eating Cheetos and Fritos because they shouldn't use the stove, it's a fire hazard. And that has very little nutritional value. And so children's needs are terribly neglected in the United States. And marriage has broken down. The majority of American women are single for the first time in our history. And they're single because the family and its promise of some support for women in the home while men are working, that's broken down, that's impossible now. And that's an economic issue because ever since in the mid to late 70s, American corporations 
deserted America to get cheap labor without ecological protections or benefits by going to places like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and China and bringing their profits back home to pervert our dem our democratic system, which is for sale, sadly enough. Ever since then, men's wages have stagnated while inflation has gone up. And so the promise, which was the promise for the majority of families, because the majority of families were white families in the United States then. But ever since the mid to late 70s, men can't support full-time domestic servants at home who are subjugated into doing housework and emotionally connecting men with other people, their children, their relatives, their parents, and the social work of arranging everything and the emotional work of comforting them and the sexual work of doing and meeting all their sexual needs, or many of them, that doesn't work anymore because women have to go out and work too and are increasingly unwilling to come home and do a second shift of domestic labor. Therefore, 70% of marriages now, marriages that end in divorce, are at the initiative of women. And blue-collar men can't find wives who want to marry them because it's a bad deal having to go out and work most of, mostly full-time and then come back to a second shift, as Arlie Hochschild wrote in her book, Second Shift. So marriage has broken down. And for those who have children, that kind of stability has broken down as the majority of people separate or get divorced if they legally married in the first place. You know, I find this remarkable because of many reasons, but I wonder what you think might be the connection between the description of a kind of step-by-step -step disintegration of the family uh, perpetrated by an economic system that imposes these things on people. How do you square that with the conservative mantra of endlessly repeating how we as a nation are committed to family values? It almost sounds as though the commitment is a commitment to something because it isn't there anymore. Yeah, it's a nostalgia for a family form that really was a failure in many ways, but created a certain stability and particularly served men. And men are particularly in trouble, which is why 97.5% of the mass shooters who shoot some, there's a mass shooting every week in the United States, at least one now, and they're all men, and also crazy groups like the incels and men's rights, our men have been destabilized. They were used to a subjugated female servant in the home. And now they don't have that. And I think it's a nostalgia for that home, which is impossible because capitalists deserted the United States to make more money. And they want to blame uppity women. They want to blame black people. They want to blame LGBTQIA people, but it's a nostalgia for a family that existed before there were rape crisis centers and battered women's centers and battered child awareness, which only started in 1962. And also where women got, you know, in the 1950s, women got 54 cents on the male dollar. So they couldn't leave, particularly if they had children, they couldn't survive. It's a nostalgia for a time when white men had total ascendancy and their women and children submission in nuclear families. That doesn't exist anymore. And the people promoting that traditional family are overwhelmingly the white male dominated right. And it's quasi-religious or organizations called like focus on family. It's a nostalgia for a family system that never worked very well, 
but that used to guarantee men a level of subjugation and servitude on the part of women and children. And it's over, thanks to capitalists. Let me ask you a key question because our time is running out. Human beings are ingenious. They always have been. Are Americans reacting, at least in part, to this crisis of the family that you have summarized so well? Are they developing new forms of family, new meanings of family, new ways of getting together and having mutual relationships and supports that replace, in some sense, the old traditional family? or at least give people the hope that there is something else if what they had before is crumbling? Well, there are initiatives. And first of all, a lot of women are refusing families. They're the single mothers and the single women who are the majority in the United States. They're refusing that idea of family and bonding with other women and friends doing what they do and participating in social networks, but not in the isolated nuclear family. Also, there are initiatives that are starting, like co-housing, where a group of people buys an apartment building or a large set of, of houses, and some of them have children, some of them don't. Some of them want to be with children, some don't. And they have collective kitchens, and people signal with little signs on their door whether they welcome a child's visit or what. And so they cooperate with child care and they have communal living. There's a whole set of apartments, but they're sadly apartments for wealthy people, wealthy working singles, where there's a small kitchen in your small apartment and a big communal space with films, with games, with eating facilities and cooking facilities together so that people have a social network, but still a little private apartment, which is very expensive. Where that was tried for Medicare recipients, it was a huge success. They took over a single room occupancy hotel and they had um, collective kitchens and facilities and people's Medicare bills went way down. Unfortunately, they didn't continue that. And that's a continuation of Maca- Joseph McCarthy when he was in charge of the household and apartment building in the United States, thinking any collective housing was communist and investing only in the suburbs. At any rate, there are initiatives, but they're not sufficient. We've come to the end of our time, so I want to thank you enormously. Obviously, we've just scratched the surface of this topic And I hope you'll come back in a little while and we can continue to talk about this powerful relationship between the family and the economy and our society as a whole. Thank you. I'd love to come. And to all of you watching, I would like to sign off, as I always do, that I look forward to speaking with you again next week.